Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Average Superstar TV. I'm your host, Lauren Lepery. Please give me that honor and smash that subscribe button. New episodes every Monday morning at 5.30 a.m. This week, we're back into the independent film world, back into the horror movie genre. Uh, my guest this week is a guy who's been doing indie films for quite a long time. He's got quite a stack of resume here. He's also a program director at The Great Bloody Disgusting. He's got his Scotch-worthy production films. He has done films such as called uh, The Muck, The Rake, A Chance in Hell, High on the Hog, Skeletons in the Closet, and so much more. We're going to get to know this guy in his whole world right now. Tony Wash, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate this, uh, this opportunity to bullshit with you for a bit. Absolutely, absolutely. So... I mean, I've been in the business now close to about 10 years. Uh, so what's your story? When did you know you want to be in the film industry, particularly the horror movie, too? Well, I've always been a fan of the horror genre ever since I was a kid. And I was able to watch the black and white stuff that my mom and dad had on VHS tapes that they taped off TV to scary stories to tell in the dark. Um, you know, there you, you go. You up all night from TV. <laughs> there you go. Um so, you know, I, that's pretty much where it started. And then from there, I progressed to the color horror films. You know, I started with Child's Play and House um, and Night of the Creeps, you know, Monster Squad, that type of stuff. And then just kind of went from there. In high school, I worked at a video store and I worked with a guy who was in his early 20s. And he was like, well, if you like horror movies, have you seen this, this, this and this? And they were all films that I'd never seen because the cover art wasn't that great. Like you look at the cover art for half of John Carpenter's movies. And they're not that interesting. The no, they're not poster. exciting at all. Yeah. The thing poster and Prince of Darkness's posters, they're just not appealing. And so as a kid, I was looking at, at things like silent night, deadly night saying, I want to see that movie. Or Without a doubt. And, and if we all remember, we all love like movies like um, Dawn of the dead, but that cover wasn't anything to sell you on. No, no not nothing. You were just like, no, like, you know, you kept hearing about it and you watched it like, oh, my God, you know, no, so. no, you were you were we were gravitating to like April Fool's Day. And you remember Dead Pit? It had like the 3D. Yeah. And even cover. like even though that she's that girl that the cover is not in it. Sleep away camp part two. Remember that? Oh, I love it. Yeah. Love you're it. like, look at this. You know? love <laughs> it. Dude, I, I rented that movie before I saw the first one. Yeah, I'm more like I'm more of a two and three guy when it comes. I, I like Pamela Springsteen, and I just I just like that era. I mean, th th those are like two movies that go to, and I love also that they're just eighty minutes, just in and out, go. Yeah, <laughs> I I absolutely love those movies. The the second one was such a great cover because it's like you got a good looking girl, she's got a backpack with all your your telltale horror guys yep. stuff in there, the the Freddy glove and the the Jason mask, and I was like, dude, I got to see this movie and. I remember I was in Boy Scouts and we did like one month every winter. We would do a, a what they called an electronic camping trip where you could bring whatever electronics you wanted and we would stay in a cabin. So we would always rent a VCR and a TV because in the 90s, you didn't have iPads and all that shit. Yeah. So we'd go to the video store. We'd rent a VCR, a, like a 20-inch television. We're talking like, you know, tiny shit. You know, kids these days, they don't realize how good they got it with technology. No. And remember uh, another thing about those TVs you're talking about? They weighed a lot when you were smaller. It, it, they were a lot harder to carry. Oh yeah, oh yeah, hundred percent. And so we got we did a five for five for five where you could rent five movies from the video store, and I was the one in charge of renting them. And I feel bad for my friends because they were probably all like, "Dude, let's watch Aliens and yeah. let's watch Terminator," you know. And it's like I come back and I got Sleepaway Camp Two, Silver Bullet, Graveyard Shift. <laughs> the Lost Boys, and I forgot. Oh, the fifth one was Maximum Overdrive. Beautiful yeah. movie. Beautiful choice. Yeah. I I was happy. I don't know if my friends were happy because if you were like 12 and you didn't love Maximum Overdrive, like there was just something wrong with you. That was just amazing. Like I just still great, minus that the cars didn't it didn't affect the cars. <laughs> the right. biggest plot hole ever. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> This virus just didn't want cars. It wanted only trucks and bigger things, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because I look back at those five movies and I think, you know, those are actually five really good movies for a group of 13-year-old kids to be watching, you know, but at the same time, it's like my friends were probably wanting action films and, and I just 
came with all these horror movies and not even thinking, you know, selfishly, I'm like, I want to watch these and I haven't been able to rent them at home. And all my friends were probably like, well, fuck you, Tony. You should have gotten Predator. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, well. Well, you know, like Alien and Predator, like that's kind of like we take them in the horror movies, but like they're just like the brother sister, like, yeah, we'll, oh. we'll, we'll, we'll take them. They're us too, you know? Oh. And, and those are, at least the movies I rented were still entertaining, you know. Silver Bullet's a great movie. Lost Boys, if you don't like Lost Boys, who the fuck are it's you? It's my favorite movie of all time. There you go. There yeah, you go. Yeah, See so, so I know. Yep. You know, and, ha and most of my guy friends that were on that trip with me probably had never seen it. I had never seen it. So, you know, how do you not enjoy that? Graveyard Shift is a great 80s horror movie, you know. Yep. So, and Sleepaway Camp 2 was great. It, all it was was tits and ass the entire time and a bunch of really great death scenes. She, she was a girl in a fucking outhouse. <laughs> and what you were talking about with the cover with that, I remember a, a kid my age came over and saw it. We saw the cover at the same time, and I'm like, like I pulled I pulled it right. I'm like, you ain't getting this back. <laughs> I walked around with it for an hour before I got it, but I'm like, no, that this, this is mine. Yeah. <laughs> for, for at least 24 hours, this movie's mine. Hell so, yeah. So all the way back, you're saying basically back at that era, you already knew what you wanted to do. Yeah. So when I was in high school is when I really started saying, you know, I, I'd love to make movies, not just watch movies and be a, I'm not just a cinephile. I actually want to participate in the process of creating film. I've always enjoyed art. I've dabbled in art, whether it's sketching or whatever, you know, I did sculpture and went to special effects school. And, you know, it's not that I'm not, decent at it it's just i'm not really good at it and i didn't have the dedication to or the patience rather to to do special effects you really have to be good at fat at sculpting fast and being good at mold making and all that and it's just not that's not my cup of tea so i kind of drifted away from that and when i was in my 20s going to tom savini's effects school out in Pitts, pittsburgh um i i was like you know here we are at this school everybody's taking still photos of their makeups and stuff and no one was taking video and no one was making movies. And so I was like, you know what? I started out by saying, I want to do a, a music video set to thriller. It's not anything that I'm going to publish or whatever, but it's just, it's an opportunity for all of my friends at school to make a monster makeup. And we'll have a group of kids having a party at a house. And while the song is playing, all these monsters that each of my friends will create makeups for will converge on this party and start killing the kids. And I like I was, it. Yeah. And, and it's like, this is a cool little thing that we can do. I started getting all these people interested and then ultimately nobody took the time to actually build their makeups. And so I said, you know what? Fuck that. There was a guy who was going to school with us who, um, I'm not, I can't even say anything because if he did happen to listen to this, he'd probably sue me for being a dick, but I don't know. I uh, fuck <laughs> he, the dude, no. should you not looked like the fan of the opera, like Lon Chaney without the makeup on? It was fucking weird. And he was renting an old funeral home that was basically condemned. And it was up on the hill in this small town called Manesson, Pennsylvania, old steel town. I think they actually shot some of the, uh, the scenes from Robocop there, the, the factory stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so he was renting this old funeral home and my one buddy was like, dude, he said we could shoot a movie there. Let's go take a look at it. And I was like, all right. So wrote a script, a guy I knew at the time who was a director was like, this is going to cost you too much money to make. So I said, all right, fuck it. I put that script to the side and I wrote a whole nother script and that's, it's my party and I'll die if I want to, um, which is the first film I did while I was going to school there to choose your own adventure movie, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's basically Night of the Demons meets Evil Dead meets Creep Show. So that's great, great combo I, right there. I'm all about it. But so that 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 was kind of like your start. So you this is this has something you were just saying, but the this is all connected to Tom when you were at Tom Savini school. And so you were were you trying to just go for effects first and then you just said I'm gonna go for all of it? Well, I always wanted to make movies. I always wanted to be a director, but I feel like most people that want to make movies want to be a director. You know, it's like, because that's the, the name and the spotlight, you know, and I never wanted to be an actor. I'm a terrible actor. Um, and so directing just seemed to be kind of my thing. And then I had a fraternity brother in college that we had been out of college for about a year and a half. And he hit me up. He was a big horror fan too. He was like, Hey, Tony, you know, at the time he was working for his dad had a printing company like a like a an off uh, like a fedex office type of store 
And he's like, you know, I'm kind of getting sick of this. I would love to go to this special effects school. Do you want to go? And I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, it's working a shitty job for like a fucking screen door company or some shit. And I just, I didn't really care for that lifestyle. I didn't want to be a normal, you know, nine to fiver. Yeah. So I said, yeah, screw it. I'll go to Pittsburgh with you. Well, he ended up not going. And even though he didn't go, I just, I ultimately was like, you know, I, I've been telling people for the last at least 10 at that time, 10, 12 years that I want to be a film director. I need to start proving to myself that this is something I'm willing to do instead of just talk about. So I went out to Pittsburgh, lived out there for about two years. Um, the special effects stuff, I was interested and I felt like I was decent enough, like I said, but as I spent time doing it, not only did I see that there were other people there that were just infinitely better than I was, even just out the gate. Like they didn't have any schooling, no practice. They were just talented. Nat natural. Yeah, yes. just natural. Yeah. yeah, essentially, you know, virtuosos, if you want to you know, say that. And, and so I just, I didn't have that ability. I had to work in order to make my stuff, you know, 85% as good as their stuff was naturally. And so that's when I just said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do the directing stuff. And, and when this opportunity to make this movie came about, um, I was dating a girl at the time we were together for like three years, we broke up and I just kind of like had that moment where I was like, all right, time to get your shit together, you know, get in shape, lose some weight, feel good about yourself and fucking make a movie because that's what you've been saying you want to do. Did you sacrifice this relationship to come to this school and not get anything out of it? You know, no, let's, let's do something. And so I made the movie with, you know, I bought the camera, didn't know how to use it, did the best I could with the knowledge I got off of manuals and, and finding shit online. Cause at the time, YouTube was not the how-to DIY center that it is today. It's made a world of difference for for any topic, not just fill, anything. I, I fixed my refrigerator. I fixed my refrigerator through, through a YouTube video yeah. once. So. Yeah, I mean yeah. my my house. All the work I've done on my house is because I watch YouTube videos, yeah. not because I read the fucking Bob Vila books or anything. So it's like when you were saying you were making your first film. It's also like that's probably like mine, the most errors you've ever done in a film, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I. I don't know if I'd say the most errors because since it was entirely mine, it was my money, my time, and the people that were working on it, it was all passion for everybody. So I think it was like there was so much more leeway and, and forgiveness with stuff because everybody was like, well, you know, we want to make this movie and we know it's a no budget movie. So let's just run with it and see what happens. Whereas now, you know, you put a movie together, it's a couple hundred grand or more for a budget. You've got a crew of 30 people on set. And, you know, if your actors are a union, for example, it's like you have so much more that you have to really, like, focus on doing correctly. So it's just stricter, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because then the end product is typically better. But, um, you know, I'd be reticent to say that you know, there's there's a large degree of, of heart that went into the first film that people recognize when they watch that movie. They, they see that, they see it's my party, I'll die if I want to. And, and even if there's, you know, blown out exterior shots and, and bad, bad dark shots and the yeah. audio is not that great, they look at it and say, this is made by horror fans for horror fans. Gotcha. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, your first film, I always said, is like kind of like, you, really the shorts is where I always say, I always tell people, go for that because that's where you grow as a, as a director. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you never want to just come out of the gate with like, oh, here's a feature. And then I was like, yo, audio pockets, this, that. Like, yeah, you, you want to do those couple test things to, you know, it's like, you know, anything. You, you need to practice at it. So I always tell people like, run with it, you know, run with it first. Yeah. But so, I, so you have like, oh, you know, looked it up, uh, looked you up. Like you have a whole, you've been doing this for 10 years uh, between shorts and features, right? 16 years now. 16. Yeah, I started my party in 2005. So um, we're actually going on, I guess, 17 years now. So so uh, you, you get your ball rolling. And I mean, I even saw you had a film or two maybe in a South by South by. I mean, that's a that's that's a big honor to get into something like that. You know, they're, they're... Yeah, so that was the short film, The Muck, which we shot in 2013. We did it for the ABCs of Death 2 contest. And um, it was for the letter M. And I didn't want to do a short. I figured, you know, short films, 
you're very, you're totally correct that you know nowadays the best way to get your feet wet in the filmmaking industry is to shoot a short film. It's yes. easier, it's cheaper, it's it takes less time, less effort, yada yada yada. Um, when I was making it to my party, it was originally it started as a short film, and it was going to be a choose your own adventure short film. But as we continued adding stuff to it, it got bigger and became a feature. But my intention was always to make it short, and so with you know now you progress 10 years from that point and now everybody's making short films because hd cameras are are all over the place it's easy to make a film now at least in terms of acquiring equipment and uh so i didn't want to do it you know i figured i had high in the hog shot at that time we've been working on skeletons in the closet which was called chop shop at that time and you know we were working on a couple other things and so Finally, one day, I don't know, I just got that idea in my head for the muck. And originally it was going to be called the Merc. And it was going to be a kid fishing in the pond in my backyard. Uh, and he gets, he catches like a Merc monster, kind of like the raft episode in Creepshow. Yep. Too. And, and then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, I don't really want my buddy, Jason, who does my effects to crawl into this disgusting pond and get covered in muck. And so then I'm like, well, why don't I do it like a girl coming home from from cheerleading practice and she's washing her hands in the kitchen sink and the muck monster comes out of the, the sink. And so then I'll call it the muck and it'll be like the blob. And then I was like, well, fuck it. You know, to me, horror movies are tits and ass and and blood and guts. And, and I'm sorry if that sounds insensitive, but that is the tradition of horror, in my opinion, from at least... The 50s to the 80s, that's what horror was, you know. It it's definitely a step in it. I mean, how, how could you how could how could anyone argue that? And, you yeah. know, I always well, hate just, nowadays people get offended by everything, you know. Yeah, well, you know, people people need to freaking be able to talk about things and also just call something exactly what it is. Yeah. We're exactly. getting way we're getting way too far away from stuff like that, you know. I agree. Nobody yeah. has a sense of humor anymore. But yep. anyways, it's so yeah, it's basically that's what I said is I'm like, let's just make this six minutes of, you know, a girl coming home from working out. I, I set it up like the scene where Sigourney Weaver gets abducted by the demons in the, the lounge chair after her aerobics class. Yep. That's what I wanted to do, only with a bathtub and the muck monster. And my cinematographer, Robert Patrick Stern, set up all these really beautiful like tracking shots where we move with this girl getting home through the house. You see the water notice that they, they you know, you shouldn't use the water um, for in the mail and yep. on the door. And then she goes upstairs, you know, and just, it, it, it's just a really, the way it was all set up worked out really well. And, and it takes place in the eighties, which is my favorite decade. And if you can follow, I mean, obviously <laughs> I, I sport as much 80s stuff as I can. Well, I got well, hey, no Squiggy, but yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> based maybe based in the fifties, but I think I think those two characters uh to me are the one of the best combos that just walked in and uh, like weekly and just killed it. Like they just, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. and they, and were, they weren't like, the main focus, but when they came in, like they were still on the show. <laughs> but they were a great pairing with Laverne and Shirley, 100%. without a doubt, without a doubt. They they were definitely them two were amazing. They really were them two actresses, but. Especially them being physical, but many Squiggy oh, yeah. definitely elevated that. Oh yeah, yeah. great show! I grew yeah. up on that show. Yeah, I think we all did. Yeah, yeah. Kids well, not not anymore so much, unfortunately. No. What are you gonna do? But it's kind of funny because we had shows we like like that that were safe, family and fun, and then we have all these like you said, <laughs> girls get naked, horror movies like all. <laughs> it's like it's like we flipped the switch being guys. Like okay. Boo. But that's what I liked about horror. Horror was the stuff I wasn't allowed to watch. And so I wanted to see it because I was like, what am, what am I missing? What am I not supposed to be seeing? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I've said this on my, on my shows, be my shows before here, but uh, like I wasn't even allowed to watch them. Like, but my dad drove me to the video store and I would walk up with these horror movies. He'd be like, Hey, Nightmare on Elm Street. But someone wants to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. No, go get that Star Trek too. Like he kept me pretty good till about 11 or 12 you know he says it was just we're italians we had like a family thing of like let's keep the violence in the sex it was going to come sooner or later anyway but let's keep the kid as a kid you know so yeah and i was probably about the same i was born 1980 so by like 91 92 
you know, I was listening to grunge music and, and I was starting to grow my hair out yep. you know, it was as long as yours when I was 14 and when I had hair. And so it's like, it, it got to that point where I was like, okay, look, I've seen child's play. I've seen house. I've seen night of the creeps. You know, can I, I've seen creep show. Can I, can I start, can I watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Can I watch, you know, and I remember my dad sitting and watching Nightmare on Elm Street with me when it was on TV. So we saw, I saw most of it. It was cable. So it was censored, but not terribly censored. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you get that slow uh, introduction to it, which I don't think is a bad thing. As much as I say, if I had a kid, because I don't have kids, but mm-hmm. I say all the time, if I had a kid, my kid would be watching, you know, it with me at six years old, you know, and, and I'd be taking him to horror conventions and stuff at the same point in time. I think like that may not be the best way to introduce a kid to horror, you know, ease them into it a little bit more so that not only do they appreciate it more at an older age, but, um, you know, cause I don't know. I, especially with everything, like what happened yesterday or two days ago at school and stuff, it's like, I, I'm like really starting to question, and again, not to get into politics and society and all that, but I'm just really starting to question to what extent younger audiences should be subjected to or have access to things like on the internet and stuff, you know, because they're so much more easily influenced. I think there's a, I'm totally with you on that. I, th- I think there's an absolute process of, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to like totally shelter a kid, but the, this is the real world. So like, what are the levels of letting them, you know, start seeing stuff? You know what I mean? hundred percent. Yeah. So like I could, <clears throat> I could use myself as, um, like I said, but my parents weren't letting me watch horror movies and my dad had a softball team and I thought his team mates were like, they might as well have been the Phillies or the Yankees to me. Like they were like the greatest guys. And one of uh, his players was having a party and they're all drinking and I, they were all drinking on a deck and they'd hand me their cups when I'm like six years old and I'd run down the steps out in the dark and fill up the, you know, fill their beer for them. And they had Friday the 13th part two on nice. and it's on HBO. And I remember my mom was with all the, you know, the baseball players, uh, women in another room. And my mom's like, don't let him see this. So when they had some beers in them, the players pulled me over for a scene we all know where the girl undresses and goes and swims in the lake. That was my introduction. They pulled me over. They pulled a six-year-old boy over, shoved in front of a TV. And there's this girl, beautiful girl. My God, wow. But that was my first time I saw a naked girl and I'm giggling slash wow, that's what a woman looks like with no clothes on. And then what happens? She comes back out, the dude gets caught up and uh, gets his ass killed. And what but, but when the giggle stopped when they when he slit his throat, and I remember like my mom walked in and starts yelling at my dad, what did we say? He's not gonna see all this and but I remember the next player came up and handed me the cup, goes, go fill me up. And I'm like, uh, I don't want, like, I didn't want to go outside, but I didn't want to look weak. So I'm like, I got to go to the bathroom. My mom's like, he's rattled. He's rattled. Look, look what happened. And I'm, I'm asking my parents, like, they know everything. You know how that was. Like, why did he do that to him? I don't want to, but would they do something wrong? Who was the guy? Why did he do that? And they're like, yeah, my mom really let him have it then. <laughs> and you know, you know, like in a couple of things, my dad was pretty good with words that night. He just shut up because he knew he knew he effed up. But I'm saying what, what the whole point is is I understand because that happened to me. It didn't traumatize me or anything, but it definitely shook me up. A six-year-old, like I saw someone, you know, that's the first time I ever saw something like that. So I understand when a parent's like does the I've always let my kid just watch it toughen them up early but i also understand when someone's like language you know we don't curse in this house you know stuff but so like i said with everything that happened the last couple days like what's the stepping yeah it's it's really tough it's a slippery slope and everybody's got an opinion and everybody isn't certainly entitled to that opinion but you know nowadays it's tough because I don't feel like people accept other people's opinions very well. Or We're in a world now where everyone's the unofficial king or queen. That's the yeah. best way I call it. If you're not in their world, if you're not going to agree with them, there's almost like 
stat sheet to be my friend. You know, let me sit you down and interview because if you don't believe in this, we can't be friends. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I, I agree. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I definitely think that there is a, uh, like that's to, to put it into a context, like that's what scares me about having a kid is the exterior influences that, you know, back when we were growing up, because you're probably about my age, I'd say yep. you're in your forties, right? Yep. I'm a little older yeah. than you. So it's like, we're, you know, we grew up in a time where your phone still had a cord. And so your, your mom could get on the phone in the other room and listen to who you were talking to if she wanted to. You know, your parents regulated what you watched on TV. You didn't have the internet. You certainly didn't have a computer in your room or a TV. I didn't have a TV in my room until I was like 16, 15 years old. And so it's like nowadays kids can find whatever they want. You know, I mean, my, my wife's nephews were, you know, five and seven years old at the time. We're looking at looking up boobs on their on their on their ipad and i look at that and i laugh at it but at the same time i'm like that that is just it's not as much as i was looking at playboys and penthouses when i was eight years old and that's how i learned about sex but at the same point in time you know i don't know if that's the right thing to do and now that i'm an adult you know i have a little better sense of myself so the one thing i'm all about with children these days is uh, like if you're like under the age of 10 don't even don't even let them be kids don't bring up sex of any kind let, let let them chase each other around let them play sports let them push each other down in the playground like let them let them have their youth before their hormones act up and ruin their life like the rest of us here listening you know <laughs> yeah, I but, agree. yeah and night get back what you just said about finding the playboys i remember there was uh all those kids in the neighborhood we all didn't get along there was a rumored playboy five miles up the road that was found in the woods so all of us who did half of us didn't like each other got on our bikes and we did a lord of the rings journey <laughs> to go look for this playboy and when we got there it wasn't there but like it was literally like i have to be back at this time i have to be back by this time like we're trying to map out the best route we're bringing all t- we're bringing backpacks it's like but <laughs> that's so all you kids that are just googling Anything you want to see? This is, what, yeah. this is what guys like me had to do back then. We had to go on journeys to see someone naked. They just they don't appreciate it. They didn't have to. They don't have to work for it anymore. All they no. do is use their fingers to type in the fucking words. Whereas now, back in the day, yeah, I and I have so many stories like that. It's funny, but you know, we digress. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. So uh, and yeah, yeah, I saw you. You had a really cool film you did with the great legend uh, Captain Spaulding, Sid. Well, hot, high on the hog. Yeah, high on the hog was a, a really, a really <laughs> awesome opportunity to um, to work with Sid Haig and uh, Joe Estevez is in that as well as uh, the late great Robert Zadar. Um, I thought I saw the Maniac Cop. I was about to bring that up. Yes. Yeah. And that, by the way, that's one of my favorite characters, part two and three. I love a, like so much. I think that's one of the most underrated characters ever. Is yeah. Officer Matt Cordell? <laughs> yeah, and and Robert Zadar, he he was he's one of those guys that like I don't I just don't think he got a ton of credit, and it's unfortunate because he had he had some pretty cool stuff. Like he was the bad guy in Tango and Cash, next to Jack Palance, of course. He was the bad guy in the. He was in some good mom movies too. Like he 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 was doing pretty good in the late eighties. So yeah, you know. yeah. So so you know, working with with all those guys was pretty cool, and. and you know, obviously, Sid is the reason why I, I took the job of directing that movie because um, I wanted to work with him. I'd worked with Tom Savini on It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want To and thought that that was pretty cool. He only came in for a day, but it was still a good opportunity. Um, and he was pretty cool to work with. But then, you know, spending a week and a half, two weeks shooting with Sid Haig, I was like, this is going to be amazing. And so uh, it, it lived up to the to the anticipation. Um, that I had and and Sid and I became pretty good friends and and uh, I ended up spending a good amount of time after the movie you know at conventions with him and just hanging out with him and I just I, I really appreciated the respect that he gave me as as his director and you know he he was very vocal about how how confident he was in my ability to create a solid story with the film 
Um, and so, you know, it was, it was just a really awesome experience at that time. Working on that movie, being on set with everybody was, was some of the best times uh, of my, you know, per professional career. I'm, I'm, I think that's amazing you got to work with him. I definitely got to know him a little bit through uh through the convention circuit like like a lot of us did and i mean he he told me some cool stories about uh like uh, actually a nightmare story with lions gate you know what happened uh, how, how they, he got screwed out of money of from the devil's rejects you know the, the main three when that when that came out uh but he, he was a great guy too as far as you you know like 15 years ago everyone you met you could have met any icon you wanted probably for $20. And when they all started jacking their prices up, he's one of the only guys that put his, put a flag down and kept it right there, kept yeah. it right, right at the 20, you know, yeah. and, and was vocal about that. Which is funny because like you just said, he, he was always, I think he was a pretty business savvy guy. And so he was very good about just being on top of the merchandising and, and and whatnot with him with his image you know we would be at conventions and if somebody was selling a a shirt that had his image on it that he hadn't approved yeah he would go over and talk to him about it and it was not one of those things where he was like you're a mother effer you yeah. know but he was also like you know if you're gonna sell this you have to get my approval you know and go through this whole process and everything and, and I just I, I respected that because it's like people didn't people were like, nervous by Sid because he's such an icon in the genre and they obviously didn't want to upset somebody like him. And so he always got the the benefit of, of like the respect from people. And when they realized they did something wrong, they would apologize. And, and, and ever since that point, then they would come up to him and talk to him and, and, you know, would give him a share of their sales and stuff. And so I always thought it was funny because you're right. He, he was always on top of like, you know, at least it seemed to me, and, and I was around him, like I said, I probably was with him at a half a dozen conventions over the five or six years after we made it high on the hog before he passed. And I would sit at the booth with him and, and take the money and give the people change while he would talk to the people and sign autographs and take pictures and stuff. And it's like, he, he just, obviously he was concerned about the money and everything, but he was never too greedy to where he was going to raise his prices. And I really respected that. It was kind of like, yeah, I'm a business guy, but at the same time, like, you know, he was so good to his fans. He was so good. And like you said, someone had merchandise that's, this is all licensing, you know, he has the right to stop. And, 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 and for the simple fact that like, you said he he calmly spoke with them. I mean, you could run over. He could have he could have yanked that all the merch off the table, but like you know, you, you can't have this. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and, you know, and, and he still did all right. He he yeah. always had a line of people at his table. He never had more than two or three minutes where there wasn't somebody standing in front of his table getting an autograph. And he was one of the nice guys where if you asked to take a picture with him, he would do it without yeah. you having to pay him or pay for an autograph to get a picture, which was nice. And he still did pretty good each weekend from what I saw. So I can only imagine what Robert Englund, who's charging $100, is making in a weekend. I mean, that's insane. That's $100 a minute. I always just say that for, for everyone that's doing at the convention. It's $100 per minute is this unreal. And I remember when I met Robert Englund, he was $25. We're talking about oh five here, but like, you know, so yeah. I got in during the great time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, inflation's a bitch. Yeah, also you also know that those, those agents are the reason that stuff because they get a kick out, they get a kickback out of it. So totally, totally. Yeah. So, but um, so the other films, I mean, you got like skeletons in the closet and the rake, you know. So, so I mean, as far as all your films, I mean, I'm in the same boat with you. You know, I made Pennsylvania Hardcore and the Dark Military, like you know, it's getting harder to make money in film and it's even like getting harder to get money to make film because of the, you know, the, the, the get back isn't what it used to be. So, I mean, how do you tread water? Well, it's actually an interesting dynamic right now, you know, and, and unfortunately it's like, I just think I have, you know, bad timing where I had three features between 2012 and 2017 
that we had put together and produced uh, high on the hog, the rake and skeletons in the closet. And they all got released between 2017 and 2018. And so to have three movies come out within a year and a half, I was like, this is amazing. Something's got to, something's got to happen. You know, so it's, there's one of these three movies, if not more than one is going to take me to the next level where I now have producers coming to me and saying, you know, what's next? Let's give you money. Let's have you direct our film. And so I was really excited. And ultimately, nothing really happened. You know, we got distribution deals with all the films. The Rake was distributed through Sony, which was pretty cool. Nice. But it didn't really go anywhere because our co-producers didn't really market it at all and didn't really put any effort into getting it into festivals so that fans could see it or anything or get it out to reviewers. So it just kind of like fell flat on its face. Which is really unfortunate because I think the rake has a lot of potential. There's a lot of great special effects in it. It's got a good story. The atmosphere is really well done, in my opinion. Um, and yeah. that's as always say that I say this to a lot of film. It's Captain Obvious. You're supposed to do it, but you had good lighting and audio. And I mean, yeah. I know it's like, but I've seen so many people send me their films, and within like one minute, I'm like, wow, yeah. they they. Oh, they I, mean, I I program for bloody disgusting television. I have a list of 200 features that I can program. Some of it's great old stuff like Piranha and yeah. Hell Knight and Popcorn. But then I'd say easily a hundred of the films that I have in the catalog I can program are like $20,000 features that were shot by, you know, a blind man with, you know, with, with a, he's shooting with a cucumber. I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it, it just doesn't look good. And, and it's like, I understand, you know, I give credit to anybody that makes a movie because it takes, it takes tenacity to make a movie. But at the same point in time, like I look at some of these movies and I'm just like, what were these people thinking? I was watching one last night as I was programming the, one of the days and it's like shot on a theater stage and it's lit with like theater lights. So it's all like overlit and, and very plainly lit. There's no contrast or anything. And you can tell it's all set pieces, and it's just so weird, um, almost like a soap opera. Um, but so, so you know, getting back to what I was saying though is that the unfortunate thing, fortunate for filmmakers now, is that if you had a feature that you hadn't distributed in like 2019, or if you had worked on one during the pandemic or just prior to, right now you're in a good spot because. They are hungry for, for movies, right? For content. Everybody needs content. And so Shudder and, and places like Bloody Disgusting TV and, and Screenbox, they're just scooping up everything that they can. And they're paying premium prices for it because they need content. And so it's, it's a bummer because, like I said, I had three movies come out between 20, like September of 2017 and April of 2019. And unfortunately it's like you know i'm sitting here and i'm looking at it and i'm like oh well you know those really didn't get any sort of decent return on them and now i've got friends that made a movie you know a year ago and they sold it and it was like sold for like half a million bucks and it's like well shit like if only we would have waited a year or two or something we might have had a better deal and would have made some money and you know, there's nothing you can do about it it's just timing um and the climate of the industry is weird right now. You know, there's a lot of really awesome opportunities for people to make films and technology is so easily accessible. Um, you know, but I think that if you, if you don't have the energy of a 25 year old and the tenacity of a, of a 25 year old to go after this, it's more difficult. And, um, and again, just the societal uh, uh, aspects of, of filmmaking right now, you know, it's, it's it's a really big deal to be a female filmmaker right now, which I think is great. I think it's awesome that they're empowering women who for the longest time were not a, a largely represented demographic in the industry. But unfortunately, that also then hinders the potential opportunities for the men in the industry. And, you know, it's 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 even hard to say that. Like, it's uncomfortable for me to say that because I'm not trying to complain about it and say, you know, oh, woe is me and the rest of the male race. But at the same point in time, it's like, if I'm being passed up for an opportunity, even though I have more experience than somebody else, but they're being hired because of a demographical 
re reason, that to me is it's not the right reason. You know, you should pick somebody because of their their. Well, it, Scotch Scotch Worthy Productions is your company, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so just like mine, I'm average superstar films. Like regardless of what what the demographic might be at the moment, what you're talking about, like we, you and I are in charge of ourselves. Hundred percent. So, so that's the coolest thing about your our position is, no matter what we dig it. Like what you're saying with that, as you just said, you don't mind the girls. I don't mind the girls. I don't. I, I love anyone who's driven and just makes anything happen. But you know, if there's anything I, I I have a drawback with is checking the boxes. What's been going on the last two years in film? That that stuff that stuff bothers me because I feel yes. you're, and it, no one in life wants to be forced into something. There's ways of, right. you know, so. Yeah, no, and I don't disagree. I, I completely believe that you you make your own destiny. You yeah. Know? And so as far as I'm concerned, if you're not doing something, it's because you're not doing something. Yeah. You no, know? no one's going to force your hand to do anything. And and so it is it is within your own capabilities. And clearly, somebody such as myself, I've been making movies for 15 years. So it's not like I can't continue making movies for 15 years. I just have other priorities on my plate and whatnot. But you know, it, it is still there. There is still the the obviously the struggle because of the, the way the economy is right now and stuff of just finding money and finding financiers and getting people people together. There's a lot of people that are still scared of COVID. And so people don't want to. I'll tell you, brother, everything I have on my slate. I was like my film, The Dark Military, I had like 70 actors in that before the crew. I can. I don't think I could ever do that again. With, with what's happened the last couple of years, is I can't tell someone to stay calm. I can't tell someone if they see someone sneezing, like, "Well, I don't want to bring that home to my children. I'm out of here." So I'm all about cutting ev the cast down and making movies of like under ten people now. And, well, and that's not cool. something I want to live with. But I'm going at the time for this time. I'm going to adapt to that for a bit. Yeah, it's it's actually really funny because like the like. The I had a, a script that I had put together and I had some money behind it. And so I went to some of my friends who are producers who have made a handful of films in the last few years. And I was like, here's this script. Here's the amount of money I have attached. Here's who I want to go after as an actor to be in it, who you have worked with. So you have a connection to this actor. Can we get this going? They read the script and they were like, okay, it's not bad, but you know, I had written a previous script to it. And they were like, this is too big. With COVID restrictions, it's way too big. There's too many people, too many locations, too much involved. Okay, I'll scale it back. I went, I rewrote a different script with literally three actors. Majority of the film is one actor and like basically one location inside a car. And then I give it to them and my, then the producers come back and they're like, oh, well, you know, this is definitely minimal locations, minimal cast, but now you've got people inside a car, which is a confined space. And so you got to worry about COVID in that regard. And I'm just like, I just can't win apparently. Yeah. You know what I mean, I think the safest thing you can do is have a film that's completely outside at all times. And, and yeah. like, how, how, how far could you run with that? Well, and it stinks because it's like, you know, I don't believe that daytime horror movies are scary. No. I didn't summer was scary. I didn't think the sacrament was scary. So to me, it's very difficult to make a daytime horror film effective. So that means that you're shooting outside at night, which is really difficult to do and really expensive and very painstaking, as anybody who shot anything at night will tell you. So it's hard. Yeah, to it's, it's hard to light those woods, man. It is very hard to light woods. And so. You know, like I said, when we were trying to set up this interview, I've been, we've owned this house now for two years. My wife and I have been renovating it for the last year and a half. We finally moved in a month ago and I still have about 15% of the projects to do. And so this has become the biggest movie I've ever produced. And, and this is what I'm focusing, you know, my producing energy on right now. And, and until this is done, you know, I think that this needs to be my primary focus and along with working with Bloody Disgusting and my, my daytime job, which is actually an overnight job. Um, so, you know, but so, hope to get back stick, to stick right where you just said. So how long were you, have you been with Bloody Disgusting? So look, explain to everyone what you're doing. You're a programmer. So is this through apps? Is there, uh, how's this all working here? 
So, so for those of who, for those of your audience that don't know, bloodydisgusting.com is arguably the largest online presence for horror. And that's not just horror movies, it's anything horror. Um, they have a podcast network. They have a television channel that runs through Roku. They own Screambox, which is the, uh, the subscription-based streaming platform that is the competition to Shudder. And they are rebranding that because it was just acquired by their parent company, Cinedyne, last year. So Blight Disgusting is just your kind of end-all, be-all, one-stop shop for everything horror in terms of news and, and whatnot and entertainment and content. And so the guys who run BlightDisgusting.com are my age. They grew up in the Chicago suburbs like I did. And so back in like 2007, when I was incorporating my company, my accountant was talking to me about it. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I have another client who runs this website. And I'm like, oh, really? Who is it? And he's like, well, you should get to know him. His name is Tom and he runs Bloody Disgusting. I'm like, no shit. Like, I know Bloody Disgusting. That's crazy. So we ended up getting connected through our accountant. And which I always thought was a really funny connection. And so I ended up going to their table that they had at the, one of the horror hound weekends back in 2009, his partner, Brad was there uh, who runs the company with them and produced the VHS movies and all that stuff. And Brad and I started talking. I didn't meet Tom at the time. I gave Brad a copy of it's my party. Half a year goes by. I don't hear anything. And then Brad comes up to me at like the next convention I'm at literally six months later. And he's like, Hey, Tony. And I'm like, he's like, Brad, bloody disgusting. I'm like, Oh, Hey man, how you doing? He's like, Hey, I'm good. Just want to let you know. I apologize that it took me so long to get back to you. You gave me your movie. I get tons of this stuff. So I had a stack of DVDs. I finally watched it. And I got to tell you, I loved it's my party and I'll die if I want to. And that meant so much to me because you know, it's just, it's hard to get, you know. It's hard to get seen. It's hard to get seen. It's hard to get seen, exactly. And and so, you know, and, and a lot of people liked It's My Party. It won a lot of festival awards. So I was very proud of what It's My Party did, considering I didn't know what I was doing making it. But I also got a lot of people. I had a guy on Netflix, because it was on Netflix when Netflix was just DVD service. Mm -hmm. It was on Netflix, and I had a guy review it saying, I should be drawn and quartered for having directed that movie. And it's like, that's pretty freaking harsh, you yeah. know? And so it was really awesome to hear that from Brad. And we just kind of became friends and we kept in a little bit of contact. And then a number of years later, that was like 2009 in 2014, after we did the muck, when the muck didn't win ABCs of death twos contest, we submitted it to a bunch of festivals. It got into South by Southwest scream fest Chicago International Film Festival, Stanley Film Festival, which was the best film festival I'd ever been to at the Stanley Hotel in Estes, Colorado, where Stephen King wrote The Shining. I was act I was just there in September. I lost my virginity there. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Such an awesome place. Such yep. an awesome place. It, it, was, it, was, it was like a Saturday night club in there. I mean, not, not that this this the lines to get into the play. I was like, wow, people really want to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's super cool. Yep. So we did all that. And, and after we basically the reason why I decided that I was willing to shoot the muck in the first place is because my roommate and co-producer, uh, Jim Peterson, was like, you know, if you're going to shoot this movie, if we don't win, why don't we put all these together? We, you know, we'll get uh, I think we had like four or five different friends who had done short films for the contest. And we said, if we don't win. Let's just put them all on a DVD and we'll sell that at the conventions for five bucks a pop. And that just grew. And we started talking to people about it and everybody was like, oh, that's a cool idea. I want to be a part of it. And so we said, you know what, let's just reach out to every short filmmaker that has made a short horror film that we can find on the Internet. And let's just put them out. Because at the time, the only place was Crypt TV. And yeah. Crypt TV was making short horror films. They weren't like necessarily acquiring them from what I know. And so... We, we just reached out to like 400 different filmmakers. We got 200 people to say yes initially. And then from there it built and we created this, this, this uh, show called World of Death. And we, we, I took World of Death to Blade Disgusting and said, guys, do you want to be a part of this? And they said, heck yeah, this is awesome. They put it on their YouTube channel and streamed it for us. We ran 200 episodes. We featured over 500 short films representing more than 50 countries 
So we made a really awesome community of horror filmmakers, some of which have gone on to make, you know, big movies now. And so from there in 2020, 2019 or 2020, we were getting ready to wrap up world of death and bloody disgusting. Brad and Tom came to me and said, Tony, you know, we, we kind of want to end world of death, but we want to evolve it into a new show. And we're thinking about calling it bloody bites. And we basically want to run this on our TV channel, which is bloody disgusting TV. And that runs through it's, it's uh, an ad based channel. It runs through Roku, which is just like a cable channel, like TBS or sci-fi channel or whatever. They just merged with, or, or they, they they just got upgraded somehow too. Yeah, they're, they're, they got bought by Cynodyne, which is a huge yeah. media company. Yeah, uh, Cynodyne owns hundreds of channels. They have thousands of movies in their catalog. They're just a gigantic, you know, mega corp. Yep. Of, of, for media, and so they bought Bloody Disgusting because their their idea was. We want Bloody Disgusting to be our brand for our horror work. And so it's original content, it's curated content. Um, and, and that's what they're doing is, is they try, you know, they wanted to also acquire Fangoria, they acquired Screenbox, and they just wanted to try and create this hub for horror. And, you know, Bloody Disgusting is is already got such a well-known name that that they just said, you we're gonna kind of give you guys the reins for all things horror that comes through Cynodyme, take charge. And so Brad and Tom said, Tony, do you want to not only program the channel, the 24 seven scheduling of the channel, we also want you to continue curating Bloody Bites, which used to be World of Death. So I work with filmmakers and acquire their films and, and showcase them and promote them. And um, I'm starting to now attend film festivals as well as conventions promoting Screenbox and Bloody Disgusting and trying to acquire films for the channel and for Screenbox. And I mean, it's it's the dream job, you know? It's like if you would have told 13-year-old Tony who's renting Sleepaway Camp 2 and The Lost Boys at the video yeah. store, when you're 40 years old, you're gonna be working for a horror company. I would have been like, nah, no way, no way. And here I am doing it, and I I, to, I totally hear you. And it's funny because the the industry is buried with people like us now, you know, the, the video oh, yeah. store people, you know, the USA up all night people. Like, yeah, so that's, that's R.I.P. Gilbert Godfrey. Oh God, it's funny. Um, I saw Gilbert one month before the sh the whole shutdown. Between his death and Norm Macdonald, and my head's still spinning like that. They're gone. Like I, I literally go to YouTube and just watch them all the time. Like it, 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 it is. We we have so many deaths today. We lost. Well, I mean, I don't know what anyone's watched, but we lost Ray Rolita. You the know, Oda. Yeah. Oda, yeah. So, but those two st stained me. I wasn't. I wasn't. I guess it's because there was no sign that they were in trouble. Yeah, you just, um, there they are in the news feed, you know. And sixty-seven for Ray Liotta is young, you know. Yeah, it is. It's young. My wife wants to watch Goodfellas tonight, so. <clears throat> yeah, dude. dude. Yeah, I mean, even Fred Ward the other day, you know, like two weeks ago. I know. So yeah, hey, well, it, 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 it's weird watching your, uh, you know, because that just you start looking in the mirror, and be like, oh no, like I mean, <laughs> like go oh, great. <laughs> Sooner or later, you know. So um, that's why I always tell everybody make the make the best of every day and 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 go after everything. I mean, you have to. You can get hit by a car tomorrow, and you have no idea. You know, I mean, it's just that's just how life is. You know, we're at the age now where you can keel over of a heart attack, and I tell my wife that all the time. I'm like, this damn house is gonna freaking kill me. Like, we need we need to we need to get our construction and everything done so that we can start enjoying it and then start relieving the stress and. Focusing on the things we love, whether it's filmmaking or trying to have a start a family or just spending time with each other, you know, yeah. sitting in my backyard and drinking a beer on my deck, you know, that's all I want to do. When you when when you're doing the programming for Bloody Disgusting, like how how are you getting your movies? Because uh, I mean, a lot of the because I know a lot of movies are like owned by other companies. So like, how 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 are they picked? Like you, you, do you yourself have to watch every one of these to be like thumbs up, thumbs down? There's, I mean, so I handle acquisitions for Bloody Disgusting, but Cynodyne being the big company that they are also has an acquisitions team. Um, and so there's one guy that I'm friends with on Facebook 
that uh, I see posts all the time about, oh, I was just at Cannes Film Market and we acquired this movie. You know, like like Cinedyne picked up uh, Pennywise, which is the documentary on the making. Michael Levy from Terrifier has a hand in that. He helped produce it. I'm all, I can't wait to see it because I love that it from 1990 so much. About the cast on both sides was amazing. So same here. Yeah, same here. I absolutely love that miniseries. That's one of the first I saw that when I was like 11 years old, and it it like made me the horror fan that I am. And so um, when I heard that we acquired that, I was really excited. But like Cinedyne acquired that, not bloody disgusting. So it'll be on screen box and, and whatnot. But so yeah, it's it there's there's a team of people. My job is more specifically to to communicate with the network of filmmakers that I am in communication with already, that I have personal relationships with, and attend these film festivals and be a a face to bloody disgusting. So that these filmmakers aren't just like, oh well. You know, my manager or my sales agency or myself or my producer are going and talking to these distributors who we don't know from Adam and they could be screwing us over as opposed to you and I are going to grab a beer after watching your movie in the theater at Panic Fest in Kansas City, which has theaters that have 300 seats in them. And it's a close, personal, you know, connection. And, and we're going to talk about your movie and we're going to talk about what would make you happy when you sell your movie and try and make you happy because we care about the filmmakers and the experience that they get through the distribution process. That's beautiful because, you know, you know, the nightmares some people get, um, you know, <laughs> never getting paid or, you know, just not push. I mean, I was part of that distributor nightmare a couple of years back. You know, I was one of those people thousand filmmakers that got screwed over so like it's good that it, <clears throat> you guys are all heart and doing it right and on top of all i mean you got the reputation for it you know yeah yeah I'm, I, and i'm really i'm really uh grateful to be you know to have been brought onto the blade disgusting team just because it is such a a, a large company and, and has such a reputation behind it that it was something that I never really thought that I would, you know, be able to have access to that that type of a, of a name, you know, behind what I'm doing. And, and so it is really incredible to be a part of that team. And I'm just excited to bring, again, the network of people that I know and, um, and just the love and, and knowledge of the horror genre that I have because I've been a fan of it for 35 years at this point. Um, so it, it, I think it's a perfect partnership. And like I said, it's a dream job for me. So I, I really couldn't ask for anything more than this. And uh, I just, I, I hope that we continue getting other really awesome new content. You know, we got uh, um, the, the guy who directed the original Grudge, the, the Japanese Grudge, did a new movie called Suicide Forest Village, which is supposed to be really cool that we got exclusive content for. Awesome. Streamers. Um, and Blade Discussing TV, we got the Pennywise documentary, like I said. Apparently, they made a new Cube movie, which is supposed to be pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> it's more like a remake of the original as opposed to like a sequel, like the fourth or fifth sequel. Um, so I'm pretty excited to check that out, which is another exclusive acquisition. And, uh, you know, it's it, it's a, a process of building. If you look back six years ago to Shudder, Shutter didn't have anything on it. You know, it was a very small catalog of content. And then in the last couple of years, they just slowly started building upon that, that base of their catalog. And, and now they acquire probably 90% of the horror content out there because a filmmaker wants their movie on Shutter. And so I know that Bloody Disgusting and Cinedyne's primary goal with Screenbox is to be a active and 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 you know good competitor to shutter um so i'm excited to see where that goes and i'm excited for you and uh it, regardless but both sides it's all great for the horror community you know because god god knows god knows we keep making these things so brother yeah yeah, yeah. there's no there's no short there's no shortness of uh of horror movies coming out anytime soon that's for sure man yeah. Tony, great, uh, great getting to know you. Great story. I, I, I think your career is freaking awesome. Being another, you know, fellow video store guys. Throw any plugs in there you like before we wrap up here. If people want to check out any of my work, you can go to my website, which is scotchworthy.com. 
It's like a bottle of scotch and worthy, like we are not worthy, but it's all <laughs> one word. That's how I always describe it, um, as silly as that is. Uh, you can go to YouTube and find Scotch Worthy TV. Um, Bloody Disgusting TV is on the Roku channel, which is an app on Roku. You can also find Bloody Bites, our show, as well as other Bloody Disgusting TV content on Pluto, on Sling. Uh, I think we're streaming through Vizio TVs as well as T TLC or TCL TVs, TCL. Um, uh, Rad, Rad TV, MX Player, uh, so you can get it through, I believe, uh, PlayStation and, and a whole bunch of other places. Chances are, if you have streaming, you can access the Blade Disgusting TV channel. And it's just a great thing to have on in the background. Really awesome content. You know, go to bladedisgusting.com. If you haven't been there, make it your homepage if you love horror as much as I do. Because um, they've got tons of great news and, and other content on there that you probably don't even realize you're missing out on. Um, lots of cool podcasts and stuff, too, to listen to if you're into listening to podcasts. and. Uh, yeah, otherwise you can check out any of my films, Skeletons in the Closet, The Rake, Eye on the Hog. You can check any of those out on uh, Tubi, Amazon, um, any of the other streaming services, pretty much. They're all on there as well. Awesome. Well, I I'd like to thank this audience for tuning in again for Average Superstar TV. Please hit that subscribe button on YouTube. A new episode every Monday morning at 5.30 also available on Stitcher and Spotify, Amazon, and iHeartRadio. And Tony, I thank you again. And with that, I will say the party is over.